shame. So what we did in the very first night is understand that shame is a core belief about myself. It's a belief about my identity, and that belief is a negative belief that something's wrong with me, I'm not good enough, I don't feel lovable, I don't feel that I have any value just for being me, so I feel inferior, less than, is my normal default setting. And we developed what that meant, where it came from, and that for basically every person from complex trauma, they end up with shame. Because once they are neglected or abused or abandoned or their needs aren't consistently met, they conclude it's their fault. So I must not be good enough. That's why I'm being neglected and abused. There must be something wrong with me. That's why I'm being neglected and abused. So they develop this developing self-concept that is all negative. What I want to do tonight is go into the next part of where does the brain then go once it's reached this conclusion that I'm not good enough. And what I want you to understand up front is this is all happening at a subconscious level. This isn't you sitting down consciously saying, I think I'm no good, what am I going to do about it? This happens in the mind of a small child at a subconscious level. So the first thing that you have to understand is the conclusion that comes is not just that I'm not good enough, but there's a second conclusion, is, which is, if the two people that brought me into the world have concluded that I'm not good enough, therefore I can be neglected or abandoned or abused, that means that anybody that gets to know me is going to abandon me or abuse me or neglect me. So I can't have that happen. And so with shame develops a fear of abandonment. And fear becomes the main emotion that trumps everything else, but at a subconscious level, and it's, I can't stand the pain of being abandoned, but I'm afraid if people get to know me, they'll abandon me again, and that scares me to death. So what am I going to do to never be abandoned? So that's where the brain starts to go. So the first conclusion is, I must hide who I am. Because if they see the real me, they will abandon me. So priority number one in my life must be to hide the real me. But the second priority is I don't want to walk around feeling like I'm a nobody. I have to somehow compensate for that feeling so that I at least feel I have some value. And then from that comes two other priorities. Though I feel like I'm not lovable and though I feel I'm, I'm not valuable, I long to be loved and I long to be respected or to have people treat me as if I have value. So here's what begins to happen. I want love and respect, but I must stay hidden. So how can I get love and respect without people getting to know the real me? And that becomes the challenge for the brain with a person with shame. And so what I want to do tonight is develop that for you so that you begin to see what the brain is trying to solve, what, this, what solutions it comes up with, and then I want to go into some of the ramifications of the solutions the brain comes up with. So the brain develops solutions that it thinks are going to fix the problem, but it's limbic brain stuff. It just makes things feel a little bit better, but it makes things worse in the long run. So here are some of the very early adaptations or solutions the brain proposes for the shame thing, how to get love and respect, but remain hidden. So number one, never be vulnerable. Never be authentic. Never let people see the parts of you that would make you weak. So don't let them see you cry because then they might look down on you. Don't let them see you sad because then they might think less of you. So now you have to hide those weak emotions, not just your personality, but those emotions that can creep out. And then once they're out, people might think less of you. So that's the first solution. 
With that, you then put on masks. So they can't see the real me. So I need to present to them something that they will like or respect. I have to do an act or a role that they will say, wow, I like that person. I want to be with that person. And so you become a mask wearer. Some of you relate to being a chameleon. You wear a mask, a different mask for each person you meet. You know how to adjust your behavior to get this person to like you and how to make a different adjustment to get this person to like you. You're very good at wearing masks. We teach about the roles that children develop as they grow up. So you talk about the hero and the jester and the invisible child and the scapegoat child. I want you to think those, about those roles in terms of shame. Because one of the purposes of those roles is not just to help the family have less pain. It's to provide a solution to shame. So the hero child says, they can't see the real me, mom and dad, because they will reject me. They will neglect me. So I will be a hero. I will be super responsible. I will never cause problems. I will do extra chores. I will be cooperative with everything they want. I will never rebel. I will help out. Then mom and dad will love me and respect me. So the child is trying to get love and respect within the family while hiding what they think are defects. The second child is that invisible child that says, I don't want to be a burden to mom and dad. That's why they don't like me. That's why they abuse me and neglect me. So I will have zero needs. I will never ask for anything. I will never share with them my dreams or desires or wants because then I might be a burden. So I have to somehow fade into the wallpaper and have zero needs or des desires. Then maybe mom and dad will say, that's a good kid. And they will respect me and love me. So still trying to solve shame. Then the jester child or the comedian says, I will hide behind humor. People won't see the real me. Mom and dad will never see the sad parts of me, the parts of me that are painful and might be a burden to them. I'll make them laugh all the time. I'll make them so they're always wanting to be with me and have me around because I just make life fun and enjoyable and everybody's happy. Trying to solve their shame. So that is one way to look at the roles. Another thing that happens naturally in the brain is this. If I am perfect, people will love me and respect me. If I please everybody, people will love me and respect me. So I won't let them see the real me. I will just be a perfectionist or a people pleaser. And then I'll get the love and the respect that I long for. Now do you see the flaw in this? You get immediate love and respect. But what goes on in your head? You go, you're being a phony. If they knew the real you, they wouldn't be loving you and respect you. So this whole thing is getting you love and respect and it feels good, but it doesn't satisfy because you know it's an act. And so that becomes the problems of this. Another solution the brain proposes is, I must lie about who I really am. I must lie about things that I do that I think might get me judged. I must keep secrets about struggles I have, failures I have, because I have to hide. And so to hide effectively, I have to become a good liar. And I have to become a good secret keeper. So again, you can see that might work in getting people to like you and respect you, but it sure isn't going to make a healthy relationship down the road if you keep lying and keeping secrets all the time. It's going to backfire sooner or later. Other people say, I will build walls around my heart. So some people isolate geographically. Who, who wants to risk relationships with people when you got shame? Because you, they're going to find you out eventually. 
So I'm not even going to go there. I'm going to have zero relationships. I'm going to become an isolator. Some do that. Not many, but some do. Others say, I want to be with people, but I'm going to isolate by creating walls. And what they do is they let you in a little bit, but then you can just feel you bump into a wall. And they're not going to let you know anything further about them. They're not going to let the relationship go any deeper. You can bang your head against that wall all you want, but they are not going to let you in. They are isolating behind walls. Others say, my internal world is shame. I'm not valuable. I'm not good enough. All of those things. So let's just make a perfect external world. Let's focus on an image. So let's get a good job. Let's have a trophy wife. Let's have perfect kids. Let's have a nice car. All of that picket fence stuff. People will love me and respect me based on my image. Again, it seems to work, but it doesn't in the long run. Others, the brain says, the only way people will never find you out is if you control everything, including controlling what people think about you. So you have to manage the information they get about you. So if there's something on Facebook that says something negative about you, you better go on Facebook and put pages of stuff about how wonderful you are and how about how terrible the person is that said those things about you. You got to information manage and control everybody's thinking about you. Some of you have tried that. And it is exhausting. And everybody gets kind of tired of you doing that. The next thing that the brain comes up with is, the only way people won't see my weakness is I have to be self-sufficient and never need anybody. I got to be able to handle every problem and never depend on anybody else so that I'm always strong. And people always see how strong I am They never see weakness or need. And some of you have tried that. And that seems to work for a while. But life delivers problems at times that we cannot handle alone. So those are some of the early solutions the brain comes up with. To try to handle the shame issue, the fear of abandonment. Trying to hide but still get love and respect. Okay? Now I want to take that. And I want to transfer that into how does that work itself out, okay? So I want you to think about shame and connection with people. So one of the things that we talk about all the time is that our brain is wired with a need for connection. So right from birth, a baby desires to connect with mom and dad. It's built into us. When a baby's born, we desire as parents to connect with it. We have it driven for connection. As we get older, we long for a partner or a deep, intimate relationship where we can connect at the deepest level. It is wired into us. Okay, think of shame this way. Shame is the result of not being able to connect. So what you might think of a time when you wanted to connect to mom or dad. Maybe you had a problem. Maybe you were hurting. Maybe you had a question. And you went to mom and dad wanting to connect and talk about this deep issue that you were struggling with. And they didn't reciprocate. They didn't let you connect. They didn't connect back. They were maybe too busy, preoccupied. They just weren't interested So you tried to connect, but there was no connection. What did you feel? Must be my fault. Maybe something's wrong with me that caused them to not want to connect with me. So shame always results when a child is unable to connect with a significant authority figure in their life. So what happens from that as they grow up? is they still long to connect, but now they're afraid to connect. So they long for that connection, but they're afraid if they do connect, somebody will find them out. So they have conflicting desires in themselves 
a longing for connection and a fear of connection at the same time. And so they live by this rule, never be authentic. Always be phony. Because if you're authentic, nobody will want to connect with you. Your only chance of connection is if you're phony. But you go, that's not going to be real connection. So here's what the brain does. It says, I wonder if there's a way to have fake connection. I wonder if it's possible to have the feelings of connection without actually connecting with somebody. I wonder if it's possible to have the feelings of connection without relationships. And that's where the brain goes. And guess what? Our culture today offers you a smorgasbord of possibilities of fake connection. What is barroom intimacy? Everybody hugs each other and laughs and smacks each other on the back and say, you're great, I just love you. And how deep did the conversation go? Less than one millimeter deep. It was superficial. There was no true intimacy, but there were the feelings of intimacy. And that's what fake connection is. So on the surface to the limbic brain, it seems to be satisfying, but it doesn't really satisfy at a deep level. It leaves you thirsty. Do you know what the, great, the fastest growing addiction in the world is right now? Internet porn. Why? Fake connection. You get the feelings of a connected relationship without a relationship. What is the purpose for many with a one-night stand? I want the feelings of connection without the mess of a relationship. What do many people get through sports? It's the only time where men hug each other and smack each other on the butt. And, and do all of that. What is going on there? We're bros. We're on the same team. I love you, buddy. You really? Because you have that warrior spirit. We're on the same team fighting a battle. And we feel close, but it's fake closeness. It's not real intimate connection. So we have all kinds of things. How about social media today? Do you realize that most of our kids will text hundreds and hundreds of times a day or message their friends and they'll say we are so connected to each other but it is so superficial they haven't truly connected do you know there was a study done just a couple years ago about millennial children who have all the texting social media stuff and what they're finding is <clears throat> this generation that seems more connected than any other generation is the loneliest generation to have yet existed because they don't have true connection. So that is the reality of our culture. We have become a culture of fake connection. And that is a result of a shame base. Let's see if we can get the feelings of connection without true intimacy. Now I want to read you something that Dr. Rachel Wurzman wrote, which I think is excellent because it's going to bring the drug picture into this whole connection thing. So she's written an article, you can read it, called, called How Loneliness Fuels Opioid Addiction. She was on TED Talks as well about this. But here's what she says. The human brain uses naturally occurring opioids. So opioids, we think of morphine, Oxycontin, fentanyl, heroin, those are all your opioids. T3s have opioids. They're painkillers, okay? But what she says is this. The brain uses naturally occurring opioids to maintain a balance among important brain circuits that shape social thinking and behavior. So opioids have a bigger purpose than then deadening pain. They're also managing other circuits in the brain that have to do with social interaction, okay? Making certain experiences like deep social connection feel good. In other words, when you connect with somebody at a heart level and are able to share in an environment where you feel totally safe, totally accepted, you feel good. 
opioids are part of what makes that happen, okay? These compounds, the most commonly known of which are endorphins, have a similar chemical structure to morphine, heroin, and oxycontin. A lack of strong social connection disrupts this balance amongst the brain circuits. So you don't get social connection. All of a sudden, your brain's not getting what it was designed to get. And the opioid thing is all out of whack. So it disrupts the balance amongst the brain circuits that use these feel-good chemicals produced by close relationships. Now she takes that in a different direction. When we are really hungry, we will eat anything. Okay, we get that on a physical level. So now what she's going to say is, similarly, loneliness creates a hunger in the brain which neurochemically hypersensitizes our reward system. Responding to the pain of loneliness, our brain prompts us to seek rewards anywhere we can find it. So in other words, if you don't get connection, your brain gets hungry for opioids. That's what she's saying. If you don't have healthy, intimate, deep connection with at least one other person, your brain is starving. And if it is starving for opioids that it can't get from relationships, which it was designed to get them from, it will look for them in other places. So guess what happens when you find opioid drugs? It says, if we seek it with heroin or opioid painkillers, it will be like a heat-seeking missile for our social reward system. All of a sudden, our brain will say, who needs people? I just found what I'm looking for. I am no longer hungry. So people are set up for opioid addictions, she is saying, because they didn't get connection in childhood. And many of you can relate to that. Okay, then she takes it further. That's in part because of the striatum, which is our autopilot system. So I talk about your default setting, okay? So what it is saying is if you start putting opioids from chemicals, not from social interaction into your brain, it changes your brain's default setting and the drug becomes the default state that keeps the pain at bay and the relief close overriding the system that would otherwise prompt us to seek human connections so why is it that many addicts the more they use the more they isolate because this system in the brain is changing and it is not saying i need relationships and connection it is saying, all I want now is drugs. And the brain changes. So now she goes to recovery. Recovery requires treatment across three categories. The first two, we do really well in our culture. So number one, medical detox and rehab. We're great at that. Number two, counseling and therapy. Both of those are thriving. What's missing? Number three, social connection. That's been ignored in our recovery world. Now she takes that even further, okay? The striatum is what gives us the source of hope here. So your striatum is your default setting. So what she's now going to say is this, your striatum, which has been changed to now say, I don't need relationships. I just want drugs. It can be rewired. It can be reprogrammed by starting to give it deep social connections that it longed for in the first place. So you can retrain it so that it longs for deep social connections again. And if we do that, we need to practice social connective behaviors instead of compulsive behaviors. It's not enough to just teach healthier responses to cues from our social reward system. In other words, it's not enough just to give people tools to cope. We have to rebuild the social reward system with reciprocal relationships to replace the drugs which relieve the craving. Our culture and communities either create environments that are either full of things that cause 
addictions to thrive or full of things that cause relationships to thrive. I think that's powerfully very well said. But the problem, as I come to the end of that, is our culture today is programmed to make addictions thrive. And we, if we are going to help people change, we have to create subcultures which are countercultures which reintroduce social connection. And that will reprogram the brain. And as the brain is reprogrammed and people are getting meaningful social connections, the desire for the opioids disappears. And so that, I think, is very significant. But here's the trick with shame. Shame says, okay, I want to connect. But as soon as you say, okay, I'm going to try and connect, fear comes up. And it says, "Uh uh-oh, what happens if they find out I'm not perfect? Uh Uh-oh, what happens if they find out who I really am? So what you're doing in recovering from shame is saying, I will risk connecting by walking through the fear of being found out. And I will trust that if I connect with the right people, it will help me to heal. But that is a scary step. Okay, second thing. How does shame affect relationships? We just did a series on codependency, so I don't want to go into great detail, but I want to recap for you how shame affects relationships. So one way to understand codependency is it's two shame-based people trying to have a relationship together. That is the best definition of codependency. So what happens is two people trying to hide who they really are, two people of masks and walls who are trying to get their needs met, trying to get love and respect without revealing who they truly are. And so that's why codependency has been called the dance of two shame-based people because they're dancing around trying to get their needs met, trying to not get the other person too angry And that is an ongoing thing. So what we have said is shame basically says, I have no positive feelings about myself because I don't believe I have value or I'm lovable. So if I am going to have any positive feelings about myself, they must come from others. So I must put on an act, okay? But one of the things the brain says is, if I'm in a relationship, that proves Somebody likes me. That proves that I must be lovable. So therefore, to deal with my shame, the brain says the solution is be in a relationship all the time. Because that will give you proof that somebody loves you, so you must be lovable. What then is the problem if you're not in a relationship and you're alone? Your brain goes, "Uh uh-oh, this is proof I'm not lovable. Therefore, i got to run into a relationship. So that's why many shame-based people, when they feel their relationship is falling apart, they don't just break it off and sit alone for a while. They don't break it off till they have somebody else ready. Because they can't be alone, because that would prove their deepest fear that they're not lovable. So here's how it works out. So you got shame in the rectangle on the left, the blue rectangle, then people respond to shame in different ways. So some people respond by going to the gray oval at the bottom, the inferior position. I'm a nobody. I'm no good. And they just walk around with zero self-image. Others respond by trying to compensate. And they act like they're better than everybody. And they go in the direction of being a narcissist. Okay? So what you need to understand is those two people find each other. Because what does the superior person want to fix their shame? Not just that I walk around feeling better. I need people to tell me I'm better than others. So I need to rescue people. I need to find people who are messed up and help them out. Because what do, I, what do they do when I help them out? They say, you are so wonderful, you are fantastic, and that heals their shame, they think. And then 
How does it help the person who feels inferior to stay that way? Well, there's always a knight in shining armor that's going to come around to rescue them. And when they come and rescue them, they go, I'm going to give you all my time. You're worth it. Here, here's some gifts. Let me spend time with you and do stuff for you. And they go, I get so much attention from being inferior. This is solving my shame. So it all starts great. It all looks like it's going to solve the shame. Now, just one thing before I go to the next slide. In the beginning, the superior person sacrifices all their needs for this inferior person. They make the inferior person the center of their universe. Okay? But that's about to change. Because what happens once they do that, they're, the superiors rescuing the inferior, the inferiors feeling rescued, and they're both feeling good, but it, they're not dealing with their shame in a meaningful way. So they're both discontent at a deep level. And so pretty soon, the superior person starts to get annoyed with the inferior person and say, why don't you carry your weight around here? I'm tired of doing everything for you. And all of a sudden, he makes himself the center of the universe. And the other person has to give up all their rights and needs and take care of them. And then the inferior person, they go, why am I not getting the attention I used to get? And they start pouting and whining and creating crisis to try to draw the other person back. And you get more and more tension. And then the superior person, they start getting abusive. They start getting controlling. They start thinking, the way to get all the love that I need is to cut everybody else out of that person's life so I'm the only one left. Then they'll give me all the love I need. So they try to isolate them from all their friends and family, trying to solve their shame. And then the relationship is drifting. It's falling apart. And both of them start to fear abandonment. So they can go back to the honeymoon and say, let's try harder. And let's be on our best behavior. The inferior person can say, I need to keep them happy. I've been too demanding, too needy. I, I need to do more things for them. And they become a caretaker and they give up more and more of their rights. But it's not solving shame. And the relationship keeps breaking down. What I want you to see is as long as shame is not dealt with, you can never have a healthy relationship. Shame has to be dealt with to some degree and both people have to be dealing with their shame in order for a relationship to have any chance to get healthy. So what can happen with a superior person when they get the inferior person? So let's just say the inferior person was you as an addict. They go, there's proof that you're sick and you're inferior. I don't have any shame. I'm superior to you. I'm helping you out. I'm a saint. I am, I'm a wonderful person. I should have angel wings growing out of my back. I have zero shame. Do you realize they got just as much shame as the other one? They're just hiding it better. And so at some point, if they don't start to see that they have shame too, they will keep needing the other person to be inferior. So the inferior person starts to deal with their shame and get healthy that messes up the way the superior person wants this to operate. And they're not getting the applause that they used to get. So they need to sabotage that person's recovery and make them sick again so they get the praise that they need. They need to feed the monster. And it doesn't work. So here's some of the extreme things that happen. For the inferior person, they become super needy, super clingy. I don't want to lose you. I don't want to lose you. So all of a sudden they got all kinds of needs. Some go to a Munchausen syndrome where every day they got a new crisis, a new pain, a new sickness. I got cancer today. I got arthritis tomorrow. And I keep drawing you back in to give me attention. Or they can go to creating drama, crisis after crisis, or they can go to the other extreme, let me just take care of you. Then you'll love me because I'm so wonderful to you. I will do extra things for you. I'll make more sacrifices for you. Just love me. Shame 
trying to get a solution, but it never works. For the superior person, they can just cut off the relationship and move on, or some, that would be failure. So they get Munchausen syndrome by proxy. I will poison you and make you sick so that you get rushed to the hospital and then I'll come rushing in to rescue you. And people do that. And you can watch Netflix stuff about that. That is a real thing that happens. Some parents do it with children so that the child still needs the parent as much as they did when they were really little. All a desperate attempt to still be the hero in that person's life. So those are things that begin to happen out of shame. I'm going to save the last two till next time. Um, But I hope that just gives you a little bit of insight into this. Shame is not just some innocent little thing that's not a big deal. Shame at the core of your being affects everything in your life negatively. That's what I want you to understand. And once... You understand that, you begin to realize it affects me, but it affects my relationships and it sets up my relationships to fail. And so I need to deal with this shame if I'm going to be healthy, if I'm going to have a healthy relationship with my kids, with my partner, with my friends. That's how big a deal it is. So how does it affect a person's relationship with God? I don't know if you ever thought of that, but I would think from my experience and what I do, that for most shame-based people, it deeply affects their relationship with God. So number one would be, why would God love me? I'm unlovable. So I don't really believe, though I believe it academically, that he loves me. I don't let myself feel that he loves me. That's part one. Part two, sadly for many churches that don't understand shame and the effect of shame. They provide ways for people to wear masks and hopefully get love and respect from God. So you can hide the real you, just come and serve and keep these rules and do these things, then God will love you. They don't feel that God loved them if they didn't do those things, but only if they do those things. And so the question that I have thought about for years and I think needs a clear answer to shame-based people is it's important to get to the point where you see that God loves you as you are. You do not have to perform or do anything. So what I wanted to do in the Christian part in this shame series is give you Bible stories that illustrate that, okay? So tonight I'm going to tell you a story from the life of King David, and we've told a number of stories from him, his life, but it's going to be about a guy named Mephibosheth. Now, I don't know who would call their kid that, but that was his name. I even thought of, how could I abbreviate that? Do I call him Fib? No, that doesn't work. Meph? No, that's too much like meth. Bosh? No, that doesn't work. <clears throat> so we got Mephibosheth. Okay, so just to give you the context, David's been king for 20 years. And so he's well established as king. During that 20 years of his reign, the nation of Israel has grown eight or conquered eight nations and grown six times its normal size. So it's expanded and it has just prospered. And so he has become basically the richest king in the world and he's got all this territory, etc. So it's a time of great popularity a time of great wealth and prestige. David is at the top of his game, at the pinnacle of his life. So the question that people have would go like this. When David became a king, the thing that they were told about David was he was a man with God's heart, a man after God's own heart. Has wealth changed him? Has power changed him? Has popularity changed him? Because that's changed a lot of people and made them terrible people. So it sticks in this story to show us that what David's heart was like, but it also shows us what God's heart is like. 
So let me tell you about this Mephibosheth guy. David, after 20 years, remembers his best friend was the previous king's son. So the previous king was King Saul. His son was Jonathan. And David and Jonathan were close, close friends, like brothers, we're told. And David made a promise to Jonathan that he would take care of his descendants if Jonathan died. So now after 20 years of being a king, he remembers that promise and he says, is there still anyone alive in Saul's family? Because I promised Jonathan I'd show them kindness. And so somebody comes and says, Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, is still alive. Now you have to understand why that was the dumbest question that people thought David should have asked. Because in that culture, the kings passed to their sons and their grandson so that you had a dynasty. So who would have been the greatest threat to King David's power as the king of Israel? A little guy named Mephibosheth. He was the only one left from King Saul's family, so he was the greatest threat to David's power and David's kingdom. So for David to say, is there still anybody alive that I can be good to? People are going, David, no. Because the common practice when a king took over a throne is he killed all the descendants of the previous king to make sure there were no threats to his kingdom. And David is doing the exact opposite He's wanting to find members of the previous king's family in order to help them. So now we're told about this Mephibosheth guy. So Saul's son, Jonathan, had a son named Mephibosheth who was a cripple since he was a child. When he was five years old, the report came that Je from Jezreel that Saul and Jonathan had died in a battle. So that's how Saul's reign ended and David became king. 20 years earlier, Saul had been in a war, Jonathan with him. They died in battle. When the news came out that Saul and Jonathan were dead, the nurse of that little boy, Mephibosheth, said, the new king's going to want to kill him. I better hide him. So she scooped him up and as she was picked him up and fled. And as she hurried away, she dropped him and he became a cripple. He broke his legs. So here is a boy who can't walk. And he hasn't been able to walk since he's been uh, very, or since five years old. So he's 25 now, 20 years of not walking. The next thing we're told about him is that when the nurse scooped him up, she took him to a place called Lodabar. And that is a, a town that was named No Pasture Land. So what she is doing is saying, what is the location in Israel that nobody would ever want to go to? Where there would be no chance of having a job, a farm, an income, because it's a desert, there's no pasture. It is the last place anybody would look. So it's the best place to hide because it's the remote, most remote place in all of Israel, Lodabar, that's where you're going, Mephibosheth. So he's been hiding in this far away, out in the desert, little village for 20 years. Okay? So nothing has happened. But what I want you to understand is that I think when it says Lodabar, no pasture land, it's also using it as a metaphor. It is saying that as Mephibosheth, the favored son of of Jonathan, who was destined to be the king of Israel, had to run and flee for his life and became a cripple. He's been a no pasture land soul. He's been dead inside. There's been nothing of life that's growing there. His life has been dark and empty and barren. Now I want you to think of that in terms of yourself. Many of you can relate to being Mephibosheth as a five-year-old, you had a good life. You had parents who were wealthy. You had a nice home. You had every privilege that a kid could get. You had it all going for you. You had a bright future ahead of you, just like Mephibosheth had. 
And he would have been chosen as the, ch- the child in the, in the nation of Israel who would have been the best at succeeding. He would have the brightest future of anybody else living in Israel. That was his destiny as a five-year-old kid. 20 years later, no family, no money, no friends, a cripple, dead, isolated, lost everything, no future. It all looks scary. His life is lived in hiding and fear. Sound like an addict who's lost everything and you're living in Lodabar. You know what? how Mephibosheth referred to himself when David finally brought him into the castle? He says, refer to me as a dead dog. And what that meant was, I'm useless. I'm full of shame. I feel I have zero value. I feel my life is like a dead dog. And that is what many of you relate to. So here is what David's story is saying. How does God feel about the Mephibosheths of the world? How does God feel about the people who've lost everything and live in fear and brokenness and emptiness with no future prospects? Does God love them or say they deserve it? I'm going to wipe them out. And what this story is saying, David has God's heart. So how David responds is how God feels about the Mephibosheths of the world. So watch what happens. David sent for him and brought him to the palace. Now you can imagine when a messenger shows up out in Lodabar and you've been hiding successfully for 20 years and says, oh, we finally found you. King David wants to see you. You're going, I hope my will's in good shape here because I'm about to be killed. You're filled with dread. And when he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. Don't be afraid, David said. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul. That's a lot of property. And you will eat here with me at the king's table. In other words, Mephibosheth, I'm giving you back what you once had. You never have to worry about being cared for again. You never have to worry about a meal again. I will meet your needs now. You are going to finally get taken care of the way you should have all along. Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, Who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? Do you want to know what God's love feels like? I don't deserve it. And that's what Mephibosheth is feeling. Why are you doing this? It doesn't logically make sense. I don't deserve this kind of love. You should be wanting to kill me, not love me. And so from that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table like one of the king's own son. He didn't get the corner table while the king's sons had the nice table and he got the scraps. No, he sat with Everybody else, he got the royal treatment. So here's the word I want you to understand, to understand God's heart. When Moses went up into a mountain wait before this time and received the Ten Commandments, he said to God, please show me what you're like. Show me your glory. And God said, I'm going to hide you in a rock, and I'm going to pass in front of you and let you see my glory, my greatness. And then he went on to say, let me describe to you myself. And what he said is, here is the core of my character. Here's the essence that all of my character is built on. And guess what it is? It's not anger like some people would try to make you think God's core is. It's a word that's called hesed. And hesed is a word that our English language can't fully capture. It's a word that includes... I am committed to you unconditionally forever. Like a parent would say to a child. It is a word that includes love, delight, forgiveness, grace, mercy. So what's mercy? I don't get what I deserve. What's grace? I get what I don't deserve. Instead of getting the judgment I deserve, I get the blessings I don't deserve. So what God is saying is you want to get to the core to me? 
to the core of me, I don't set up relationships based on you earn my love. All my relationships are grace and mercy. Has said, I overflow in giving people what they do not deserve, a kindness and forgiveness. It talked about a depth of love only known by a parent or a couple that loves each other in a deep, healthy way. And that's what it is saying is God's love. So how does God feel about the Mephibosheths of the world? Is he saying, you got to earn my love? Is he saying, you better hide your shame and start keeping these rules? He says, I see your shame. I see what you deserve. I see all of that about you. But I want you to know something. You're living in Lodabar. You're empty. All of those things. I'm going to find you and I'm going to love you. And I want to bless you. And I want to fill up your life again. And I want to give you gifts that you could never earn. And I'm giving them to you all because of grace. And that is the message that 